I'm, uh, I'm Robert. Um, I founded a consumer VPN company in Bucharest 2011. We started with a small team of seven people to work on the idea to protect people's privacy online through a consumer VPN. We started with a few hundred a thousand free users, we had a free service, and um, we developed the company in two and a half years, two years, now up to around three million free user accounts. We have a staff now of 20 people working in Bucharest and Germany, and we made a pretty huge business out of it. So we made a business out of privacy. We are running a company that offers privacy as a service. And uh, I want to talk about <clears throat> this stuff with you and uh, the backgrounds and the chances we have here in Europe to build companies based on data security and privacy. <clears throat> a few words about, about myself. I'm um, from Germany. Um, I moved to uh, Bucharest to um, found this amazing company here. I'm a sucker for Italian coffee. I just had over there this amazing coffee. Somebody you got, got one of these coffees over there? Wow. Don't do it, really. It's, uh, don't do it. Um, I love Excel sheets. I love, I, I, I'm a business freak. I love uh, uh, retention rates, conversion rates, stuff like that. I'm really good in, in, in business things. And um, I'm a football fan, I'm a sucker of, of uh, uh, St. Pauli. And uh, what, what you see here in the background is the amazing stadium of uh, the FC St. Pauli in, in Hamburg. So whenever you have the chance to uh, go to Hamburg, um, go and visit St. Pauli. So St. Pauli is an alternative left-wing soccer club in the red light district of, of Hamburg. And, um, it's simply amazing, and this uh, this uh, logo here, this sign, is the official logo of the of the club. And uh, you could you could you could all help me out a bit to to. I, I was not I was not in Hamburg since eight or nine months. I'm really missing it. So maybe you could help me to have a bit of stadium atmosphere here. Maybe you could get all up of your seats for me, please. Get up from your seats, please. Come on, get up. It's it's, it's really it's really easy. So um, come on, everybody. Super easy. A bit, a bit of stadium atmosphere, a bit of Pauli in, 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 in Bucharest. Super nice. So take your hands and start to clap. And fast. One muscle. Fast, 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 fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's San Pauli. Thank you. What, what I really want to speak with you about is, is um, what Henry Louis Stimson said in the 40s. He was an American statesman, a lawyer, and a member of the Republican political party in, in, the, in the USA. And he said back then, gentlemen, do not read each other's name. So, if you have a look on what happens right now, we can consider for sure one thing, there are not a lot of gentlemen in politics. And um, I don't know if you know... <coughs> one, two, one, two. NSA sold. Yeah, the NSA hacked us already. <laughs> I don't know who knows this, this building. Anybody knows it? What is it? NSA. Right, that's the NSA headquarter. Uh, it's located in Fort George Mead in Maryland. It has 280,000 square meters of floor space. And um, to see the, the, the space and the relations of these spaces, you could easily fit the United States Capitol four times into this building. The US Capitol is the place where the US Congress is controlling the NSA. It's like, you know, I have, I have a dog at home, and I call this dog Wotan. Wotan is an incredible 
name, you know, like like you know, to scare people. And I always, you know, if, if it comes to protecting myself, I tell people, hey, I will, I will call for Botan. And, and then sometimes I, I, I call him and say, Wotan, come on, Wotan. And then Wotan shows up and Wotan is, is 10 centimeter. Well, he's super cute, you know, and, and he's 20, 20, 40 centimeters tall. And, and, and Wotan couldn't, couldn't scare anyone. That's the dimension of the US Congress and the NSA. So we have here a monster that is controlled by a Congress that has less capacities of, of these months. So what we see right now is that we live in the golden ages of surveillance. At the 6th of June, The Guardian and The Washington Post started to publish secret documents of Edward Snowden. The main actors are the NSA and the British Secret Service. And there are new words we learned in the last half year or last, last uh, year. There are the five eyes. Because they have just the legal right to monitor foreigners. Uh, by the way, I'm a foreigner. You are all foreigners. The American Secret Service is spying on foreigners. That means they spy on 96% of the world's population. And to get the other 4%, they build it a coalition with Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So everybody is watching everybody, and they exchange the data. So it's kind of legal what they do. And um, they build it also a network of partnerships they partner now with Germany, France, Belgium, Japan, South Korea. I think every day new names are popping up in this, in this game. Um, pretty interesting is they don't only cooperate technically, which is other, they also cooperate politically. There is a document leaked by Edward Snowden from the NSA speaking about the cooperation with the German Secret Service. <clears throat> we have a pretty high level of data security laws in Germany and in Europe, also in Romania, and that's not good for the work of secret services. So what the NSA did was, they helped them somehow out with knowledge. They wrote in a paper, we have been assisting the German secret service in making the case for reform or reinterpretation of the very restrictive interception legislation in Germany. Ooh. There are high level laws in Europe and they don't like it. So help our secret services to somehow make politics in their countries, in our countries. What we see right now is <coughs> against this gentleman agreement not to spy on other people's data, that we have an overall surveillance of the internet, and honestly speaking, this is just a synonym for the overall surveillance of the society. That's what it is. And if you think about someone who thought very early about surveillance of society, we have uh, somebody in Church Oval. And um, Church Oval wrote a novel in 1949 called 1984. Um, this novel was based in Airstrip One, formerly known as Great Britain which is a super state of, of uh, Oceania, a world of uh, being in war, a uh, world of an omnipresent government, uh, a world of uh, 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 overall surveillance and public mind control. But, <clears throat> frankly speaking, George Orwell was an optimist. His biggest fear was that the government might at some point install some screens in our apartments to watch it us, um, do the same at working spaces, um, install some, some microphones all over, um, maybe open our written correspondence and, and, and track that, and maybe also pay some thought control police, undercover agents who pose as normal citizens and report any person with supersive tendencies to them. That was 
the biggest fear of a surveillance state back then. If we compare that with our um, reality here is that this is very invasive. So you see the screens, you see that surveillance state invading the privacy of people. What happens right now, and that is the problem, this is why we don't take action. This is why we all listen to the scandals, we read the newspapers, but it's kind of meh. Why? Because the surveillance right now is not noticeable. We don't see it. We don't feel it. We don't feel it in our daily routine. We are brutally honest to search engines. We are more honest to search engines for, than to our relatives or friends. And try to remember um, what you searched for in the last six months. And um, I want to ask you if any one of you would like to share, share his search history of the last six months with the public. Raise your hands. Who would share his search history? Nobody. Yeah. Nobody would do that ever. But we deliver these data to Google. We deliver these data to Yahoo. We deliver these data to Facebook. But we wouldn't share them with our relatives. And that's why they build a system where they think they can catch the bad guys by, you know, yeah, let's do some illegal stuff, okay, blah, 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 and then they find the terrorists. What they install is a system of wholesale blanket surveillance. And um, I just want to go through some, some, some facts, we all know them, but we should put them together on, on, on one slide and see how, how, how big this is. They, they simply start to collect uh, all phone data of all Americans uh, for the past seven years. Uh, they did the same in Spain. They collected between two and two months 60 million phone calls. They did the same in, in, in France. They collected 70 million phone calls. They monitored internet communication at clouds of Google and Yahoo. Eight, 800 million data records in 30 days. The NSC groups every day around 700,000 email addresses and 500,000 body lists. They just grab it. The NSC can access smartphones, means contact lists and SMS, SMS notes for the positions of iPhones, Android, and Blackberries. They have a program called this key score. Uh, with this program, they can nearly and they go and nearly everything in user does on the internet. Edward Snowden started to leak the documents by saying that he was able to access nearly all personal data of a human being or a person just by knowing his email address. And with prison, the NSD has 16,000 direct access on the user data of Microsoft and Google and Facebook. That's huge. And um, it is pretty obvious that since 9-11, Secret services all over the world build a real parallel universe. They build a so-called deep state in between our states. Without any public control and starting to have a mind-blowing life of themselves. They are protected by our governments and um, I believe that we deal right now with a secret unregulated and anti-democratic monster. And to make this really visual, because these are just numbers, and it's like I said, you know, we don't notice that in our real life. It's not really invasive. It's nothing we can touch, like the, the screens of George Orwell, or, or you know, uh, the overall screens uh, at, at, at public places and stuff like that. The George Orwell world is, is scary. This world is, I don't know, we are used to it, and, and, and sometimes we don't even realize that our own data are also delivered to them. We have to have a look at the NSA data center in Utah. That's something where you can see what they do. And this is a picture. Looks uh, kind of impressive. 
But let us look at some, some numbers. It was 8.7 billion construction costs for just one data set. They need another 2 billion for hardware and software. They need up to 40 million dollars a year to pay their electricity bills. It's kind of impressive. They need 6,500 tons of water a day. The size is 140,000 square meters for a data center. And they have between 3 to 12 exabytes storage capacity. You're all experts here, I don't have to talk too much about these numbers. Translated to the world population, it simply means that they have enough capacity in one single data center to store the data of every single one of us for practically forever. And that's the reality we live in right now. And my question is, why the heck they do it? I mean, the there is, there is an old saying, you know, I, I, had, I had a friend, he always did crazy shit, you know, and afterwards I was like, man, why did you do that? And he said, because I can. So, uh, they do that for sure, because they, they can, but there, there, is, there is another, another reason why. <laughs> and this is the reason why. Oh, this is the reason why. They tell us why. The war on terrorism. 9-11 was a switch point in history, and since then, the United States fights terrorism, terrorism, and terrorism, and I have no doubt that there are terrorists out there that do crazy shit and shit should fight against them. But let's have a look on the things they do with their programs that are not exactly related to fighting terrorism. For example, in November, the NSA spied during the G8 and 220 summit in 2010 on the uh, people who have been on this conference, for sure not terrorists. In October 2013, it came out that the NSA monitored calls of 35 world leaders. They listened, for example, on the phone calls of Angela Merkel, she's a chancellor of Germany, I didn't vote for her, but I can say one thing for sure, this lady is not a terrorist. Far off. No need to listen to their phone calls. In September 2013, the GCHQ hacked the Belgian provider, Belgacom, <coughs> who serves the EU Parliament, EU Commission, and the EU Council. Incredible! A British Secret Service member of the European Union hacks literally a European company to spy on European parliamentarians. That's unbelievable because they fight terrorism. In July 2013, the NSA hides banking devices in the embassies of France, Italy, and Greece in the United States. I don't see any connection between France, Italy, Greece and the worldwide network of terrorists. So I doubt that this war is just on terrorism. They wouldn't do that if it's just about terrorism. And secondly, they didn't make the world a better place or even a more secure place since they run these programs. There are no signs for that. All their official statements and numbers about crimes and terrorism they allegedly avoided turned out so far as a full flop. There is nothing behind it. They didn't catch any big guys through it. And I say really honestly one thing here, the risks of dying because of terrorism are against zero. But the risk of getting kidnapped and deported by the US Secret Service is significantly higher than that. So 
they don't make the world a more secure place, for sure not. So what do they do then? There is a very interesting document. It was published by the New York Times at the end of November 2013. It is an NSA document from 2012, headlined with Signet Strategy. It contains very irritating words like vision, mission, and values. These are usually words, you know, I know from lame company presentation if they try to somehow peg their business models into missions and visions and, and, and shit like that, you know. It's, um, it's a bit like maybe this worldwide surveillance is a billion dollar business for US corporations. Maybe there's a business behind it. And um, there is a very interesting passage in this document. Um, under values, you find a very irritating phrase that upsets, alarms, but explains a lot about what they do. Our customers and stakeholders can rely on us to provide timely, high quality products and services. Huh? Products and services? A secret service has customers, products, and services? Do they really mean that? Yes, they do. The problem with this is, obviously, there is an industry around these mass surveillance. And Edward Snowden itself is uh, a good proof for that. Snowden was, since 2009, no longer a civil servant. Uh, he was a simple employee um, of private companies. And he had access to all these data. What we see is a privatization of a state task. So if it is a task to survey people, then it is for sure a state task. But they made a privatization out of it. They did the same in the 1970s with uh, US prisons. They started to privatize them. And the result of this privatization of a state task in the United States was that the amount of prisoners octuplicated from around 300,000 prisoners back then to 2.4 million prisoners, which is kind of funny because the civil society in the U.S. pays now with their tax money for the limitation of their own freedom. That's how it is when you privatize state tasks like that. We have a second part of this phrase. And this second part is because we never stop innovating and improving and we never give up. This is for me the most scary exclamation mark of the 21st century. We never stop innovating and improving and we never give up. This problem will not be solved by itself. Never, ever. So I think it is really time to wake up from the matrix, if you allow the picture. And um, <clears throat> because I'm also here to, to talk not only about my business, maybe also be talk about my, my, my personal um, way through this scandal, because we talk about a very personal thing here. At the end, we talk about privacy, our own privacy, about our personal human rights. They don't attack a society, they attack every single one of us as a human being, as an individual. And um, that's why I want to talk a bit about my four stages of waking up through this scandal. First was the 6th of June. I was simply surprised, believe me, I'm, I'm, I'm super paranoid. I'm working in this industry since, since a couple of years. You're all paranoid. We are paranoid by, 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 by set up. But this was, was, oh, by the way, we, we, we got here these, these, 
these nice toys at the, at the beginning and I was here with my colleague Selena. She's our, our PR and the first thing she did is that a bugging device? Hello, hello. It's a nice event here. We just met nice people. So we are really parano paranoid about what, what, what we are doing here. But the size of what happens was so big that I thought, okay, that's bigger than I could ever, ever imagine what it is. It changed a bit and um, it got outrage. That was the next feeling I, I have. After I was surprised, I, got, I was outraged. Why? Because of the reaction of the politicians on that, this case. That was unbelievable, you know? I, I mean, <laughs> he showed up a day after the 6th and talked about, you know, these old things, security versus privacy, you know? And his statement was kind of, you know, we could have expected it. I think it's important to recognize that you can't have 100% security and also then have 100% privacy and zero inconvenience. Huh? This is the old story they tell us that there is a balance between uh, privacy and security. Like, you know, um, if, if you have 100% uh, uh, privacy, you can't have security. So, and, and if you want to have more security, you have to have less, less, less privacy. Like, you know, it's, it's percentage. Give away 10% of privacy and then you get uh, more security and stuff like that. And it's simply, you know, it's awfully wrong what he said. Because after the scandal, what he meant, he, he said that, but what he meant is people give up 100% of your privacy and maybe you gain a bit of security. That's what he said. That's the first thing. And it's wrong. And I'm questioning that there is a balance between security and pri privacy. I'm questioning that. We should all question that in future if they tell us this bullshit. Privacy is not negotiable. It is a basic human right. A civil right approach must be in the center of everything we do if we want to live in a free and liberal society. There is simply nothing to balance. Civil rights are unvulnerable rights and there must be a very good reason to restrict them in a very single case. If they are behind a murder and if they have doubts, if they have proofs, I'm not staying here and say, don't throw down his privacy, don't survey him then. But that's not what they do. What they do right now is that they survey people, they know for sure that they are innocent. And that's not okay. Next was Confucian. A bit later then, I got totally confused because then I talked, started to talk with the people in my, in my, in my, in my, uh, uh, that, that have, have been surrounded me, friends and, and, and employees and people, people I met. And um, the reaction on this scandal have been really, really great. So, you all know these reactions, I'm sure. I don't tell you now some, some surprisingly new things. First is, um, no surprise. Um, I knew. I, I think a lot of you thought like, yeah, I knew that forever. Do not let anybody tell you that we already knew that is simply not true. We did not know. We thought maybe they do it. People like you and me maybe had some technical experiences knowing that maybe, yeah, really they are behind something, but this size is so incredibly high, is so incredibly big that we did not know. I don't mind. I have nothing to hide. That was the second reaction. And you know what the worst thing about that is? People who told me that did that with zero irony. They meant it. And you know what this means? People didn't even think one second about what this means. I have nothing to hide. 
I, I, I mean, tell me that you don't have anything to hide. I would never share a private secret with you because you don't can't you can't keep secrets. That's the first thing. And the th second thing is, here we talk basically about privacy and what privacy is about. I mean, every chat online is for me just you know a digital extension of a personal talk face to face with people. Every email I write is just a digital extension of a letter I write in 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 in, in the real world. And uh, if private conversations between lovers, friends, family members are surveyed by a state agency, that means that they take, us a, take away the basic human right to be an individual. We will start to act like they want us to act if they continue with that. Second thing, the possibility to meet in a private protected space is a basic requirement for the work of labor union representatives, journalists, do we have journalists here? I think we have. Journalists, lawyers, political activists, and many more. These people are the backbone of any free society. To survey them, to control them, turns the whole world upside down. We have to control them, not they have to control us. And thirdly speaking, a private protected space is the basis for doing business. We are talking here about secret services, they are doing simply industrial espionage. The development of a free market is dependent on the possibility to exchange knowledge and have talks in a private environment. They are simply fighting everything which is related to a free market. And the next thing is, Facebook is surveyed, your fault when you use it. It's a bit like, you know, and that's, I agree, we all agree here, but people, what chance do we have? Please think about the last five, six, seven, services you used in the last few days. And I'm sure it's Facebook, it's Twitter, it's Microsoft, it's SkyDrive, it's Dropbox. The list can be endless. The problem is that most of the services we use are US-based services and there are not really alternatives. And people don't tell me that there are technical alternatives. There are alternatives for you, but there are not alternatives for people who have to install software and access technology in an easy way. Next reaction, I know but we can't do anything about it. I will talk about that a bit later because we can do a lot about it. Finally I got angry and that's very healthy. Because outrage has no point, simply outrage. But anger has a direction. And I am really angry about secret, a secret, a big, big, big secret service machinery that violates the constitutional state by telling us that they want to protect the constitutional state. That's weird and it makes me angry. And then, I have a look on the reaction of us here in Europe. So what was the role of the EU secret services during the NSA scandal? What did our secret services do here? And I figured out four possibilities. Maybe you agree. When you find a new one, tell me, tell me afterwards. I'm, I'm curious about it. First of all, first, first possibility, they supported it. So, if they supported it, that means that they have been involved in committing a crime, definitely. If our secret services supported them, they have been involved in committing a crime. Bad problem. Second possibility, they knew about it, but didn't support it. It's a possibility. But that means that they should have informed our, have informed our governments. And if the government said nothing, they did harm not to protect the citizens. Also, bad problem. Third possibility, 
They knew about it, but didn't inform the government. Also a possibility. But that means that the secret services did a serious violation of their obligations. Or fourth possibility, also possible, they didn't know about what's going on. And in that case, that's the worst case, by the way, they are totally incapable and can be suspended. Why do we need secret services if they don't get it that we are spied every day by secret services from abroad? So then suspend them. It makes me angry. It makes me angry that we have governments in Europe that react with a mix of inability, unwillingness, and appeasement politic. And it makes me angry that they lie. And it makes me angry that they are even bad liars. And I, oh, I, had, um, I promised my, my, my PR here that I don't say the F word, because I usually do. But, but really, I have a fucking right to live in a fucking constitutional state with a fucking respected constitution. That's what I want. And that's what I expect from my governments, that they do that. And that's why I am angry about what they do with us. But we have to learn something about it. And um, I think there are some, some, some learnings. And, um, One of the learnings is the NSA and others stepped all over the Constitution. This thing went way too far without any discussion. And um, that to do is, unfortunately, after we have to reform a lot here in Europe with our secret services, we have to work on the consolidation of an European Union counter-strike intelligent service. I don't like to say that, but obviously there's a need for something like that. And no spy agreement with the United States will not help at all. They violate all contracts we have with them every single day. There is a contract with the United States called Safe Harbor. It should somehow regulate the, the data uh, that goes from America to Europe and stuff like that and should make it secure. They violate the Safe Harbor contract every single day. We can cancel it. Don't sign contracts with them. It makes no sense. And because they do, obviously, industrial, industrial espionage, we need also pressure and contracts in this area. We have to put pressure on the economical part of this scandal. Second learning, the technical paranoia of nerds around surveillance is reality. So maybe me, you, we all have been right. Surveillance is built in by default. And that means we simply have to build European alternatives, however it would look like. So don't, don't stand up now and tell me, Robert, how, what shall we do? I don't know, but we have to do something. There have to be an alternative to Facebook, to Google, to Microsoft Windows and stuff like that. And it has to be easy, accessible for everybody. Problem is right now, that we don't live in a surveillance state. So we can say, hey, it's all fine in, in, in Romania. Hey, it's all fine in Germany. Hey, it's all fine in Great Britain. We don't live in surveillance states. We live in a surveillance world. And this surveillance world is called the internet. And the problem is that these big internet service providers make our life easier every single day. I don't doubt that it's cool to search on Google. It's cool to use an Android phone and stuff like that but we pay a high price for it, and we pay the price of total mass surveillance, and we have to build alternatives. And I'm very proud that my small company, CyberGhost VPN, started to do something like that. We built an alternative and we made a business out of it, and I want that a lot of people following us. Third of all, every mobile phone is until further notice a bugging device. We should realize that. And every email and, and every online chat is until further notice a public conversation. And that to do is easy, we need continuous encryption of all relevant communication. We need it of side of hardware, software, and provider. Encryption has to be a standard. Encryption is a very powerful technology, but what they do right now is it's unbelievable. They build backdoors into something that is so secure. If you have a single file, and you, you encrypt this single file, and you take all the computers of all the world, and you know that. It takes millions of years to decrypt this single file. What they do is 
they take this technology, this brilliant technology, and weaken it up by purpose, by building backdoors. It's, it's kind of the same like we would have to build now in our houses, apartments, literally backdoors. Every house has a back door and we give this general key to the police station because it might have happened that they have to enter our place because maybe one of us is a bad guy. But all of us have to hand over a general key and if this general key is in the wrong hands, we are all fucked up. That means because of having a bit of more security, we all have to give up our, 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 our right on privacy at home and we have to weaken up a perfect system like locking our doors by a backdoor system. That's the same. That's what they do right now. And it makes no sense. So, what do we have to do? We, ha we, we can do something. And I think, talking about CyberGhost VPN, the fact that we are located in Romania uh, represents at the moment a valuable asset, and we all should think about that. You people here in this room are part of the solution. We can take the chance to build sustainable businesses around privacy and data security. It is very obvious that the European Union offers a higher standard in data security than the US. And it's less of a secret right now that we are here structurally ahead of the USA. I'm always discussing a lot with people from the IT industry Ah, it's a problem to build big companies here in Europe, you know, all the money is in Silicon Valley, all the engineers and the politics is so friendly to them and we have some of these problems here in, in, in Europe to build companies. First time in history we are structurally ahead of them, culturally speaking, politically speaking, legally speaking and maybe technically speaking because our connection, our, our way how we access open source projects and stuff like that is a bit more, more experience. We have a bit more experience than American companies. If we have a look over the ocean right now to the United States, we, sh we saw two current shutdowns of US privacy companies. First was Lavabit, the email provider of Edward Snowden, shut down rather than handing over keys to the state authorities. Second was uh, um, a VPN company called CryptoSeal, and that means right now, single mess a simple message. Encryption technology from US-based company is not to trust, and the US are not the place to run privacy-based services. So what we can do is, oh, I have also, this phrase has also a second part. I wanted to have a phrase also with the second part. You remember this NSA stuff with the second part. We can build here, large and sustainable businesses around privacy and data security. And if we want, we can kick some Silicon Valley asses. And if we take this message from here, I think we can go ahead and build companies around privacy and security. Thanks a lot. And, and maybe if you, if, you have, if you have some questions, uh, allow me to have a commercial break for our amazing VPN product.